interested in the, well, one of the things Rob talked about, the fragment hunt in the library that we did yesterday. Uh, then you can read about it tomorrow in the newspaper. Um, there was a, a journalist in the room who were uh, screaming with joy as they were looking through the books, so I'm pretty sure it will be a colorful piece. <laughs> uh, we're not going to talk about any fragments or uh, little bits of pieces of manuscripts. We're going to talk about big, chunky books, uh, monastic books as they were made in medieval society. Um, monastic books are uh, an interesting object to look at, for one thing, because when you look in a library at these objects, your whole desk is filled. So if you only have, if you have three on your desk, you you have piles of, of dead animals on your on your desk, of course, because of many manuscripts made out of parchment. Whereas if you look at, for example, what I talked about before on campus, uh, the the students' books, those are little little, little pieces of parchment, so little you know cute little things on your desk. No, no, with the, with the monastic books, you have a big clunker coming. And it's always a pleasure to open that because it makes a noise when you open the book. So imagine that we're all sitting at a, a library uh, tonight and I'll introduce you to some of these uh, volumes. But I'm going to do uh, a number of other things as well. And I'll do those first. That is, I'm going to briefly talk to you about what a manuscript actually is because I imagine that many of you have never seen one or touched one. So I'll take a little bit of time to do that. And I want to talk about uh, the order in which the Carthusian order, which is very important because there is a very direct relationship between what the order was all about and what the books that these monks that belong to the order um, actually used looked like. So there's, there's an interesting relationship between sort of the rules by which these individuals lived and the books as physical objects. And that's exactly what I do in life with my project with five people. We're looking at the physical appearance of books. I always tell my students uh, not to read but to look because uh, reading distracts from actually understanding the book as an object. So uh, stop reading if you're reading, but, uh, and let's think about uh, physical appearance. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? All that stuff. Okay, this is what we're not going to talk about. So I'm, I'm not interested in print at the moment. So we're moving to an age before the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg. Um, or other people, as other scholars might want to say. But um, there, so from the middle of the 15th century on, you have a printed object, which means that you go to a bookstore and you, you buy something that your neighbor can also buy. It looks exactly the same. There's 1,000 copies that actually are copies in that they look precisely the same as their 999 other things that are lying on a big pile in the printer shop. So, of course, we have uh, an object made with letters that are it's a mechanical process, and even the, the production of these letters is a mechanical process. And it's very, very different from the world I'm going to take you to um, over the next hour or so. So this is what you need to know about medieval manuscripts. If you were taking a course and um, uh, see some of the people here that were in some of my classes, this is the first slide I would show you, because this tells it all. You need tools that you hold in your hands, either to write or to prick, so prick little uh, holes in the parchment because uh, there's no lines on the beast and therefore there's no lines on the page. You need to draw these lines yourself and if you want to do it straight, which is of course what everybody wants with a nice clear straight book, you need to first prick holes on the outside, get your ruler and you draw lines. So as a person who's making a book, you have your pricking device, like a, in the later middle it will be a wheel that you roll over the page and punches holes at uh, regular intervals. Um, <clears throat> you also need materials, which is on the other side. You need your dead cows, or later in the Middle Ages, your paper. Um, if you are in a different part of the world, a different age, you have papyrus. You may have uh, pieces of a tree, palm leaves to write on. I've seen those very recently at the Light University uh, Library. It has a, lar a large collection of palm leaf, uh, pa palm tree leaves, which is quite astonishing to look at because it, it, if you touch it, it almost falls apart. That's not the case um, in the age that we're looking at. So we are primarily looking at the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, and parchment is in that period the predominant um, um, sort of carrier of text, because that's what you're looking, looking at. Parchment holds the text, and we're not interested in text <coughs> tonight, but of course the people who held these objects and who bought them at a certain point or made them themselves, they were very much interested in uh, the text that they carried, and they could, could perhaps care less, much less, uh, about what actually they were holding, what the, what the object looks like. So in a sense we're doing something that medieval readers would find a little bit weird. Why would you talk about an object? This is just a book. But of course that's the uh, 
thing that happens at university is we all find our own little niches that we then uh, sort of explore and say, well, this is very important because, uh, you know, and so I will say this is, I think, very important that we're looking at medieval books in this particular way. Up to around 1100, we can say that book production was a monastic affair. You may have learned or heard that book production in the Middle Ages was always monastic, and I can assure you that was just the case up to 1100, but also that after 1100, but particularly after 1200, it's very much not a monastic affair anymore. We'll talk about this uh, next week on Wednesday, and I'll show you then that from 1200 onwards, it's a commercial affair which means that we no longer have monks. We have monks producing books a little bit, but not to the extent uh, at, at all, like what we see before 1100. But after 1200, we have uh, commercial people doing this for money. In it for the money is the title for Wednesday. Um, uh, earning their peanut butter and jam on uh, bagels um, with production of books, sales of books, uh, illuminating, binding, etc. It's a very, very different world. I find it a very intriguing world because, of course, as soon as you activate economy, money, people expect more from you. Because if you do something for free, people are willing to look at mistakes. And, and you know, in Holland we have a, a, an expression, you, you may not look in the mouth uh, of a horse that's given to you. I'm not sure if it's in English as well. Yes, there you go. Well, that thing, right? So commercial books is very different. You expect the highest quality and you will complain if you don't get that. That's not the case in monastic book production. Not that all books were flawed, but it's a different mindset. It's a different dynamic. And so it's very nice, I think, to tonight talk about the one end of the spectrum and on Wednesday look very much at the other end. This is a, just a little visualization of what we're talking about. So it's monastic, monastic, monastic. Then there is the century in the middle, but the 12th century where you have a split that is to say, both are present. We see the first commercial uh, traces, but the monks are also very present. And um, in the 13th century, well, you know how the commercial world is starting. We're looking at this uh, person, not so much the individual itself, but this is a Carthusian monk. So this is the kind of monk that we're following tonight. And it's interesting to do this in light of a lecture on book production, because where monastic Scribes are slowly doing less and less throughout the 12th and 13th centuries. These Carthusians just keep on trying. They keep on going, they keep their books, they do it in the same fashion, the making of the books as they did before, as if nothing else had happened in the world, if there was no changes at all. Um, this is interesting because, of course, these monks, well, not of course because you don't know it yet, but I do, um, <laughs> they, they, they were all in their own little cells in their monasteries. They did not see the world very much. In fact, they did not see their fellow monks very much because they were secluded locked up for the entire duration, duration of the week, um, with the exception of a half hour on the Sunday, at which point they could leave their cell, see their fellow monks, all 13 of them, there are always 14 in a, in a, in a, a Carthusian house, and they could talk about, as the rule says, useful things. So you can't talk about the television program that you saw yesterday, you have to talk about something that is actually useful. Well, I met Augustine the other day, and I found so interesting. That sort of thing. Well, you, you may want to choose to stay in your cell, but these people are probably very happy that they were out for, for half an hour. <coughs> the connection between these monks and book production is interesting because, for us, in, in the lecture series on book production, because they're actually not just producing books while other monks do not do this anymore after 1100, or, or, or to a lesser extent. No, it's interesting because the Carthusians are very active producing books, that's one. So they keep on doing it, but also in a very active sense. Um, they're also doing this with the difficulty of not being able to speak to each other. And if you've been to some of the events on campus, you know that book production is all about collaboration. There is a scribe, there is a, a rubricator, somebody who writes the, the red lines on top of a chapter saying what's in the chapter. There's a decorator, there's a binder, etc. And not all of these stages were necessary necessarily sort of uh, highly interactive, but you can imagine if you, for example, write the book and you copy the text with flaws and there is an individual who will check afterwards uh, what mistakes you made and then correct it. That particular collaboration is very important that you can say, okay, 
look, I copied this, I think it means this, and then somebody else will say, no, no, because here is another copy of that text, and there it says this, so what could it really be? So the, the Carthusians, as I will show you later, are all about, we want to have the best copy ever. It needs to be flawless. And to do that, to make that flawless copy, you need multiple people, and that, of course, was a problem, since they're all locked up, except for that half hour on Sunday. So Carthusians are interesting not just for their high level of output, but also because they managed to make these books that they produced <coughs> flawless. There were hardly any mistakes in. So that's something we're going to look at later as well. <coughs> okay, to understand all this and to really, really uh, see the significance of this very important order for the production of uh, monastic books in the later Middle Ages, I need to sort of lay the historical background, lay it out and, and build a little bit, and then you, um, it sort of opens your eyes and you'll understand much better the significance of this order. So I'm going to do that now. <coughs> and the best thing to do is to go back in time. We need to go back to an age where monasticism was very different from what we see in the late 11th century when the Carthusians are established, and I'll get to the establishment of the order in a second. So in the late 11th century, early 12th century, when Carthusians are first producing their books in a very unique manner, um, they did what a lot of orders did not do. They went back to the roots of monasticism, and you see the roots right here. It's in a, a, a desert. This is just one desert, but monastic, monastic houses were generally uh, found in deserts. And it's significant for the order that they try to replicate <coughs> that earliest stage of living apart from the world um, for the glory of God um, in a house secluded from everybody else uh, and obeying a, a number of rules. So what we see in the 11th century with the start of the Carthusians, but also with a broader movement in society is a return to a more traditional way of living in a Christian sense. And it's important um, to realize that it's all about a sort of a plain life, so no fancy stuff, a very rudimentary, crude kind of living, without any wealth. It consists of a mix of contemplation and physical labor, and in the uh, new orders that were established in the late century, it's all, in the late 11th century, it's all about that mix. It's all about we need to contemplate and we write texts that help us contemplate God and Christ, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we also do physical labor. So you, in most monasteries and nunneries, there's always actions going on with your hands. Uh, and not, not just scratching your head, but also you know, producing, weaving, uh, and, and the Carthusians then chose to do book production. So Christian monasticism was born in the third century. And it started with um, individuals, anchorites, who retreated to the monasteries by themselves, and then somebody else came, and then trickled, some more people trickled in, so you need to build a larger house, and so you can imagine how you go from a single person who felt the need to retreat from the city to the desert, um, and then followed by other people who admired that lifestyle, slowly that developed into sort of um, a monastery. It wasn't me meant to be a monastery always, but it uh, very often developed into one. So the word monk, as we have it now, um, comes from Greek monos, which means alone, and that tells you exactly the core what the core is of these individuals retreating from the world. They want to be by themselves because, of course, then you can contemplate and then you can also do the labor you need to get closer to God. That's the idea. Uh, one of the earliest converts to this new monastic life in this early period is uh, St. Jerome. And there's a letter he wrote to a bishop and he says the following, and this is a good example of uh, what it's all about in this early period. If you want to perform the office of a priest, Jerome says, Live in cities and townships, and make the salvation of others the gain of your soul. But if you desire to be what is called a monk, that is solitary, or, mon or, or monos, or alone, um, what are you doing in cities, which after all are the dwelling places not of solitaries, but of the many? So, a very early voice, an important one, because Jerome, of course, is an important church father, that has copied a, a lot during the Middle Ages, and he inspired a lot of people. He says it, in, in a sense, in this particular line, if you want to be a priest with the many, go, go to the city, and otherwise you, you do not need to be there. There's another place that's much better. There's a very nice uh, example still, a nice example, it's a very fascinating example, even, 
of a monastery that's still here now. It's the oldest uh, monastery that's still functioning, and it's in the Sinai Desert, uh, the Abbey of St. Catherine's. And uh, up to the 1970s, you could only enter by having yourself holed up uh, in a sort of an elevator, a, a, a lift, a little platform made out of wood with ropes that they would sort of cart you in. There was no entry on the ground level, of course, for protection. And this monastery is not just interesting for this uh, early uh, movement, so it was actually one of the earliest monasteries ever built, but also because it has a large library that continues all the way from that early period up to now. It has about 3,300 manuscripts and most of them extremely old. And just wanted to, to mention this because this monastery actually shows you still what these objects or these places actually are, that is repositories of wisdom. 3,300 manuscripts and that's not printed books, so from before print. Um, that's what they have in the library, and that's what's been inspiring these individuals throughout the centuries in this particular place. Um, and very recently, and this is also why I'm mentioning this, in my project we're trying to do a lot of things with sort of the digital world, which is what they all have to do now to get money from uh, you know, digital humanities is the, is the buzzword. There is a, there's a very nice uh, project that just started and that will get its first fruits in next year, in 2013. Um, it, it turns out that many of these books in the library actually have other texts hidden underneath them. That is to say, if you have a lack of parchment, which you can imagine that's often the case in the desert, there's no, not so many cows or sheep running around, and at some point you run out of stuff to write on, then you say, okay, well, we have four Augustines, let's just scrape off the text of this one Augustine that we have and put something else on. And then you have what we call in uh, book history, we book history an upper and a lower text. And the upper text is already old, uh, might be 9th century, if that, if that scraping happens in the 9th century, but what they scrape off, the lower text, might be 7th, 6th, or 5th century. And so what you see here on this image is a younger text, well younger, still 6th century, that runs from top to bottom, it's a dark letter, but the, the, the older text can still be made visible with spectrum analysis, and that's the reddish letter, and that's then this Greek text, and it's much older. So this is also a recently uh, sort of a value, a added value to this particular monastery in the library because it has not just a repository of 3300 manuscripts, which is astonishing for a house, but it has even more. I don't know how many, but it could be four or five, uh, 5,000 uh, texts easily. So what we see in the 11th century is that people start to see how people lived in that early stage. So how, how did people actually uh, do this, retreating into the desert. Um, all the problems that came with it, people start to be interested in that, get an interest. And so you get actually, because of this interest, and this is very fascinating, you, you get individuals who start to do the same thing. So you get what we call a, a her hermitical movement, it starts in Brittany and in, in France, where individuals start to retreat to the forest. And it very quickly gets picked up um, by other individuals and also by literature. So in the text of this age, you get uh, these hermits that feature, and they're really often seen as a, as a funny character in the, the romances, for example, of Christian de Troyes. It's the, the first really our novel, so as we have it nowadays, with uh, what we call entrelacement, which means we put different scenes in a certain order, and then we go back in time to another individual who goes through different things around the same time that we just followed, you know, how a novel works, right? That's invented in, in this period, and the hermit has an important role to play. It's the individual who is wives, he's retreated, and he uh, has a long beard, and, and, and the iconography in the Middle Ages, the, the way he's depicted is always the same, he has his you know, scruffy clothes on, and long beard. He's often ridiculed, um, and, and a, a few of these uh, stories are actually are very hilarious, so they were meant to be sort of to ridicule, to be ridiculed in the court, for example, and, and one of these stories um, is, is that a bunch of knights go into the forest, and they see one of these hermits, and the hermit is like, wow, what are you, angels? No, we're just knights. It's to show you know, these people don't know what the world is like, because they don't even know what a knight looks like. So this is what's happening in the late 11th century. It's one example of a movement back to the original way of doing business, not just as, as monks, but also as individuals who want to lead a better Christian life. It's no surprise that out of this movement, out of this new interest into the old way of doing things, also come more formalized organizations who do this in a structural way. There's two orders that are, um, two monastic orders that in particular are very important, and one is the Cistercian order, 
And this, this is a very good image to show you what happened with the Cistercians. I'm not going to talk about it too, too long because I want to move to the really important stuff, that is the books. But uh, just to, I need to, I need to uh, address the Cistercians a little bit. It's an order found in, 19, uh, sorry, in 1098 by Robert of Molesmer. And you see him here leading his brothers away from the city into the desert. And that's actually the language that they use to describe what they're doing. They're moving away from the buzz into the desert. Solitude. They're seeking solitude. What you see in the text that they start to write is also something that is reflected by what the Carthusians are doing, who start almost uh, around the same time. So they say we enjoy poverty. Um, well, okay, that's great. Um, but, of course, there, there's a wonderful irony with this whole order. That is, they were so good at being uh, poverty, that's not the right word, at uh, being not, uh, you know, not attracting any wealth, that people admired it so much that they gave them money. <laughs> so, so the Cistercian one gained wealth, and so they started to establish more houses, because sort of to spread around the wealth and to keep, uh, to remain poor in a sense. So I, I like that irony very much. What they wanted also was manual labor. So they're very keen on um, doing things with your hands. And this is of course not the first time you hear this this evening, because it's what the Carthusians are doing as well, and what people in uh, the early desert uh, establishments also did. So this is, for, this is a very famous uh, Cistercian manuscript. You can see some of the labor that they did, chopping wood, um, harvesting, and um, preparing wood for uh, building furniture. You might say, think, yeah, well, these are all very normal things to do with your hands. Yes, but normally monks would not do these things. So you would acquire your uh, food that you need from farmers. You would buy your furniture ready-made, etc. So the Cistercians are saying here, and they're showing with this manuscript, we are making our own stuff. And that's unheard of in this period. And it's nice to see that, that you can link that to the, the, the planar life and also the, the, the mix of contemplation and doing stuff with your hands. Then, finally, the Carthusians. Those are the second group, they form the second group of formalized living in this particular poor sense, in this way back to the roots. So let's have a look at what Carthusians were all about, and then we'll move to um, the books that they made. So the order of the Carthusians was a little bit older than the Cistercians. It was established in 1080 by one Bruno of Cologne and a group of hermits. So Bruno retreated, a bunch of people followed him. Um, you know, the sources say 12, but that's of course not necessarily, uh, it's of course uh, the analogy to Christ and his disciples, but there it is uh, historically evidence for this is, uh, is very clear that he retreated, people followed him, and that's how it started, the ball started to roll. They first went to a very, very remote site near Grenoble in the, in the French Alps, and um, they, they were super, super, uh, they made very sure that they had the, the most difficult place to live. And so much so that in the winter, when snow began to fall and began to roll down the hill, their whole monastery was pushed down into the valley. And they rebuilt it and it was pushed down again. And so they were smart and they said, well, maybe we should turn it down one notch. And they sort of moved to halfway the valley, and that's where then they established their mother house, the house of Citeaux, uh, sorry, not of Citeaux, the house of uh, Chartreuse, because that was the name of the valley. And it looked like this. So it's still pretty remote, even now, but you can imagine the Middle Ages uh, with no roads and villages being further away, that was even, even worse. The remoteness is something that you find in the documents related to this order. For example, we have letters, and I, I personally always like to look at letters to get a, a grip of what makes make people think what an order is all about, because they're usually very frank about things, and they, the letter is a good medium also to complain, to ask for things, whereas if you have a chronicle or a literary work that you know might not necessarily tell you the truth. The, the letters with respect to this order are very, very clear. Here's one from Peter de Venderbal, and he writes in 1132, when it's, the whole game is already, uh, so the ball is already rolling for a few decades, he says, he visits every year, except it was of the opinion of everybody that no horseman could reach you on the account of the vast amount of snow, and I despaired of being able to do it on foot, he writes in 1132. So he apologizes, he says, I come every year, but I can't, there's just too much snow. And it tells you something about, you know, people want to come, but cannot come. And so you can imagine during the winter you were in total isolation, and that's precisely what they wanted. Far away from the world, nobody can enter just like that. 
And so you have Carthusian houses, charter houses, they're also called, um, in remote places, and that sort of what binds them. So very quickly after this very successful first establishment, more and more houses appeared all over Europe, and they uh, are bound together by a number of things. One is, it's one complex, but it consists of 14 little houses, and I'll show you an example of the inside in a minute, um, that when these monks lived in, and then one dining hall and a few central buildings that they would use uh, together, but only very infrequently. And it's far away from everywhere, and it often uh, involves uh, not prairies like here, but mountains, because of course that's what keeps people really away. The most important person for the order and for understanding why book production by the Carthusians is so different from other um, monastic orders is Guigo, Guigo the First, and he died in 1137. He's called the architect of the order because he writes down a number of rules that will sort of evolve into the monastic rule that the Carthusians um, adapt and adopted and still adapt uh, nowadays. There's a few houses still uh, still active. So the architect of the order, and he's really, he's quite a guy. He really loves books, and he loves them so much that uh, the people start to complain about him talking about it. And let me, let me take you through a few quotes of letters uh, to and from him. Here's one about uh, lending books. Peter de Venerable again uh, writes a letter from Cluny to Guido, so in a sense from the busyness of the city into the remoteness. How these letters got there, I have no idea. Must be, somebody must have taken them. Um, and Peter writes, I have sent you the booklet of the Epistle of the Blessed Ambrose, and one of the proposition of, of St. Magnus. The treatise of St. Hilary on the Psalms I have not sent because I have found that our copy has the same textual corruption as yours. So that's <coughs> telling. Not just they were text shot over from the city into the desert, so to speak, into the valley, but also he's referring to a question of Guigo, namely, he you can, you can reason yourself, there will have been a letter from Guigo to Peter saying, our, our book is, has, is corrupt, has mistakes, has flaws. Could you check me if you have a better one? And since it says, because I found our copy has the same textual corruption as yours, he probably quoted. He says, ours has this and it doesn't feel right. And ours has that and it doesn't feel right either. And so Peter checked and he said, no, ours has it as well. Well, I would say as a philologist that I'm also, I said, well, it's not textual corruption. Both have the same, so it must be what the text is all about. But it, the main point here is that Guigo checked his book, reasoned that it was incorrect, and then wrote a letter to the other side of the world, so to speak, to, to ask for a better copy. And that is what the Carthusians are all about, as I will show you in a minute. Here's another example from a letter. This is about Guigo's passion for books. So this is Peter writing to Guigo, and he's complaining. He says, the letter you sent talked only about books and was silent about those who, to whom the books are to be sent. <laughs> so we is yapping and yapping and yapping and it's in his letter. But it's all about, you know, bringing this and this book and Russell is so great and then, oh, it's the fortune that we have is so great. But, and then Peter says, what about the people who are going to read this, uh, these objects, right? And the last one is with reference to the title. is a letter from uh, Rigo to Peter. He says, can you please send us, if you can, if you can the larger volume of St. Augustine's letter for a part of ours has been accidentally eaten by a bear. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you can just imagine a warm day, Carthusian monk strolling outside on the meadow with Augustine under his arm. Oops, there's a bear, he drops it, runs inside, and the bear eats it. It needs to be replaced, and this is put in a letter and, and shipped off um, to, to Peter. So these are just some examples of um, Guigo's passion for books, especially the yapping about books all the time and forgetting to talk about all the monks. You know, they were interested in these monks. How are you guys doing there in the, in the, in the valley? Are you all still alive? Well, no, you won't find, find out because Guigo's only talking about books and texts. This guy writes the rules by which the Carthusians will start to live. And you can imagine that these rules will be very bookish. And that's also why this, this person and the rules are so important, because it, it will essentially, for the coming years, determine, in the coming centuries, determine how people in these monasteries deal with books, and actually how they look at them, how they perceive them, and what their relationship with these objects uh, are. Yes. So, what do these rules say? And this is where we move a lot closer to book production. 
actually were sitting almost on their laps, laps of the scribes. Uh, one of the things that we can see is, I'll give you a quote. We teach, this is Rigo talking in his rule, and the rule is read by Carthusians, and they read it, and then they know, okay, this is what I have to do. So he says, we teach writing to almost all whom we receive. So whether you're good at writing or not, you will be given a pen and an ink pot, and you shall write books. That's essentially what he said. <laughs> Second thing. The more books we copy, there's also a whole lot of other things, right? Like how to eat meat and how to hunt and, and uh, where to get your stuff from, how to deal with uh, guests, etc. But I'm picking out the book which uh, so. The more books we copy, the more witnesses of the holy truth we send into the world. This is interesting, because this is actually at the core of what their book production is all about. They cannot go out, and normally monks go out into the world to care uh, for the sick, to feed the, the poor and the hungry, etc., to look after people in society. That's what they can't do it, because they're in this, in this cell. All, all day, uh, all night. So they say, the books we copy, that's our message. That's how we support this larger movement of Christianity in Europe. Third example, Sylvan Wigo's uh, rules. Let the brethren take care of the books they receive from the cupboards, so that they do, do not get soiled with smoke or dirt, because books are, as it were, the everlasting food of our souls. We wish them to be carefully kept. Well, there's, there's very few orders that have rules that are so detailed about what you cannot, cannot do. Nouns are used, like covered, soil, smoke, and dirt. That's not something you read in the Rule of Benedict. They will just say in the Rule of Benedict, we copy books, and that's it. Another one. We need to look after books so that we may preach the word of God by the works of our hands, since we cannot do so with our mouths. So, not allowed to speak. <clears throat> I said it before. And books become the message of um, this, this order. Also, very practical points. Here are a few. We copy at least three hours per day. Well, that's quite a lot, because you're very busy as a monk. You have to you're running from, from here to there in your cell, that's to speak. That's to say. So you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to uh, read in your book, you have to pray, you have to sing, you hunt for yourself. But also, three hours there in your day, you need to um, copy the text. It even stipulates what has to be on your desk, namely, Copying table, so that's your desk, quills, ink pots, stones to treat parchment, so to, to rub the surface so that it catches the ink better, chalk, knives, ruler, lead, ruling board, wax table, all that stuff. Of course, we all know that scribes had this, and all the other scribes in monastic houses also had this in, in non Carthusian houses, but Guigo has to tell these individuals this is what you have to have on your desk. And, and so it's very telling about how dominant he is in, in sort of this whole spiel of, of being a monk, and how he's a micromanager. That's essentially, that's essentially what he is. <coughs> he refers to correcting. He says, we need to correct our text. And this is the one thing that he's not so specific about. He's a bit wishy-washy about uh, how to correct a manuscript. So there are texts written within the Carthusian order to, to speculate what he may have meant with correcting. And so, for example, we have Oswald, uh, who writes the Opus Practice in the 15th century, still survives in the Huntington Library, the original text. And it discusses in detail how you correct a work, how you can find a flaw. You, you, correct, you correct by uh, comparing different copies of the same text. It's essentially what, what philologists these days, these days do. He talks about uniformity. So when you copy something, make sure that you always do it in the same way, you use the same punctuation, the same style of capitals, etc. Grammatical structure is very important. So this is a, a text that fits right into the order. It's not talking about the specifics of how to put a book together, because you can read that in, in, the, in the rules of Wigo, but this particular text by Oswald is talking about how you put text on the page. And that's also very unusual in monastic orders, to hear somebody say, this is how I have to write down my text. It, it's almost as if somebody is guiding your hand. You cannot do something else because there's all these people that are waiting for gone, looking over your shoulders uh, in, in spirit, so to speak. So, in sum, Carthusians produce a lot. They do it in a certain way, and they are very keen on doing it in a certain way because their rule tells them so. So Carthusian houses are isolated from the world. They cannot shop for books as other people can when you're in the city and go to a commercial producer. And so they have to make it themselves. So that's essentially what we have done um, so far. 
It's no surprise then that the Carthusian houses throughout Europe started to adopt a certain way of producing books. Now, I need to be honest and, and tell you that when I look at a, a manuscript and it's of Cistercian order, I can also tell that. I can say this is Cistercian from the type of script, the abbreviations, the punctuation, and especially the colors of the decoration. It's, it's not possible to do this for Benedictine or Augustinian books from those houses. So, with the exception of Cistercians, the Carthusian manuscripts can be can be recognized because they have certain traits. And that's, of course, you now know why, because there is such an order that is so closely clinging on to this, to this set of rules that was written in the very early 12th century, and essentially that's what they keep on doing throughout the centuries. So what are some of these um, sort of fixed features that you see in monastic houses that are part of the Carthusian order? The first, the first and foremost is, and you know this already, manuscripts are corrected very carefully. So Carthusian books have lots of corrections, subtle corrections, erased text, scraped off the page, new text put on. You sometimes have to look really carefully, but in general, um, these books are very good. They're, they're, it's a good read, but also it's a flawless read. The second thing is, and, and I've seen a few of these, uh, that manuscripts of Carthusian houses contain complaints in the margin. Say, for example, this is a flawed text. <laughs> or this scribe did a terrible job. So they, so they not only feel that they have to correct, but they want to reflect on their corrections. It's in a sense uh, what you sometimes want to do as a teacher. Don't you don't just want to say how to do it to, to your student, but also you want to say it's bad what he did. Right? <laughs> you don't, because it's actually not very good to do. But, but they did. Those Scarfusians felt the need to grab the pen just to put the margin out of crappy book was. <laughs> Another very interesting thing is that um, they have a very large book collection with a very small library. Well, how is that possible? That's possible because, of course, they had the books in their cells. So a lot of, normally a monastery has a very large library, and these are taken out into the library itself because the monk can go freely throughout the house and read wherever he wants, and usually there's tables, etc. It's very much like how we do it now when it's in the library. But since these Carthusians were in their, in their own little cells, they had to pick a library book, take it, or rather have it brought, carted by a, a lay brother on, actually, I've, I've seen pictures in the 15th century, on a little cart, it's rolling like it's a prison, which in a sense is true, I guess. Um, bring these books to the various monks and pick up the ones that were finished with. This also means that you need to have a high volume of books that were very popular. So if Augustine, for example, this, you need more than one copy of Augustine, because Augustine might be in that cell, but the other cell needs one too. Everyone needs Augustine. So that's another, um, uh, feature of, of these particular houses, they have a high volume of uh, double and triple copies of the same text. What they also have is long and detailed book lists, and that's because there are so many books that are away, not sort of available in one location because they're scattered throughout the house. There needs to be a good book list that keeps track of what we have and where they are. And so that's what we see in these houses as well, more so than in other places and earlier as well. Another feature is the care for books. You already uh, heard a few examples of this. But we have, for example, in the late Middle Ages, a number of manuals from librarians in uh, charter houses and Carthusian houses outlining in detail how you should treat a book. You don't write in it in black or with red in it, you know, just in case you thought, oh, I can do it with red, then no. Also not with red. You have to make sure that there's no dust inside. You cannot eat over your book, etc. Everything that you want your students to, uh, to do as well, and what they, of course, all don't listen to. You have to check your book to see if it's of sufficient thickness when you bind it. Because if you bind a thin book, the, the bindings in the Middle Ages are made of uh, wooden boards, oak. It will rip the book apart if the actual book, the pages are too, there's too few of them. So they, they knew this, and so they stipulate this. Wait till you have proper volume, and then you bind it. You know, who would think of writing this down, but that's what they do. We clean our books twice per year. That's excellent. So the books are cleaned, a little dusting, uh, you know, a vacuum cleaner going through the pages, all this stuff going on. The last feature, general, so these are all general features of uh, Carthusian houses, and they're all very different from what we see uh, on the map of Europe and other particular uh, monasteries of, of other uh, orders. 
What they also need Carthusians is lending books to other houses. And you can imagine why that is. This constant copying, you need also a constant flow of books coming in, in a sense, because you don't want to have, copy Augustine again, because we already have 20,000 copies. And now we need to look at, okay, but I need to write my three hours of the day. Okay, let's see if we can get some more interesting texts from other houses. And so there's a back and forth shooting of these books throughout, not just in a region between two houses that are very close together, but also within one country, and even interlibrary loan, if you want, over the borders. And so we have also, consequently, complaints about uh, uh, people who say, where is our books? <coughs> oh, we, we gave them to somebody to, they, they could keep it for a year. So whenever, when you go to the annual meeting of all the abbots, which was once per year, make sure that you talk to this guy from this monastery and ask him to book back, etc. So that's what you see as well. There's letters going all over Europe, right before these uh, events, the annual coming together in one spot, and it's like a political tour. Right? Where people would uh, then write letters before and say, okay, could you please bring your Augustine and the one that we gave you, and we'll bring your book back. So it's, it's, a, it's a lively interaction, not just the thoughts of people talking to each other, which is quite normal in, in monks going all over the place, but also in the texts and books that they brought with them and that they sent um, from one place to the other. Okay, all this was very theoretical, Sylvia. And uh, you, you trust me, of course, that this is all true. But I'm going to show you a few examples to bring this into practice. So we're going to go to this particular place. It's the Charter House Burn, 30 kilometers from Brussels, very appropriate, appropriately um, far away from the city. And it was, at some point, a large uh, domain, as you can see on the black and white picture. But most of it has gone apart from that one building and one more mill nearby. So this is the house that I did my PhD on uh, ages ago, it feels, in, I finished in 2002. And it has a number of <clears throat> very interesting things that fit right into all the elements of the order that we talked about so far. First is that there is a strong awareness in this house that texts are flawed and that the text in front of you the text that you read, or that you're about to copy, may also be. And a person who's very, very keen on this, and is very interested also in uh, avoiding this, not just that he does that, but also people around him, is the person we call the Bible translator of 1360. That's because he made a Bible translation in 1360, we don't know his name, and that's then the, the, the name that we gave him. This is a later uh, copy. He writes, uh, he copies and translates 12 uh, Latin texts into Middle Dutch. So this particular monastery is very keen on producing a lot of vernacular books, which is also something you see in uh, Charterhouse in Germany, much more so than the Benedictines and other orders. The Carthusians are very much into, well, if you don't understand uh, Latin, then we will make sure that there is a copy for you that you will be able to understand, namely you want vernacular. And that's, you can see that's the message, right? That's their contribution to uh, making sure that people have a, a good time in Christian Europe, so to speak, being a good Christian. So this translator, in his prologues, um, points out things that tell you something about uh, the correctness of text. For example, he says, at one point, he says at the end of the, the prologue of the Bible, he says, I know scribes will want to change this text because they know better than me, but they should not do so. So he's already anticipating that somebody will come and think, okay, well, this translator was quite obviously wrong here. So he says, no, I'm right. This is good. Don't touch my text. <laughs> Here's another example that is aware of flaws and people uh, intervening with the, what he thinks the perfect text. He says, of many words presented here, a perfect Dutch word cannot be given. It's a problem with all translators, also from Arabic into Latin in the 12th century, and here from Latin into Middle Dutch. Sometimes there's no equivalent in the, in the target language. And so you need to think of something that clumps close, or you use the Latin word and you sort of give it a vernacular spin. That's what we call transliteration that also happens. So he says, of many words presented here, a perfect Dutch, words cannot be given. It's also an excuse. So apologize if you think this is weird, but I did the best I could. These I will translate as well as I can, but I will also present their meaning in a gloss equipped with a paragraph, as is done in books of authority. So he says, if I think it's not good enough, I'm going to write a little gloss in the margin, <coughs> explaining that one word that you may not understand well. So, so it's like a two, three, four layers of, of catching people that may potentially read something wrong. And okay, if you do then not understand what I mean, then there's a gloss, right? So, uh, 
And as the German books of authority, that's exactly what happens in Latin books, for example, made in, uh, in Paris, where there's a little loss in the margin uh, that explains certain notions of Aristotle. There's a beautiful example also, and here we get some more um, manuscript images, um, from this epistolary. So it's an epistolary, it's the New Testament minus the Gospels, and it's used for uh, liturgical purposes. What we call parallel church book because, of course, the real liturgy in the Mass is in Latin, but there was, a, there was some sort of uh, uh, vernacular equivalent. Uh, it has a, lo a lot of mistakes in it, as you can see, because they're noted. And this is what happens. I'll explain how this uh, book works. It's a beautiful example. You don't get them that often. It's beautiful, and that's why we're doing it here. Um, so, this is a text that was copied, and while the main scribe was copying, he compared it to the Vulgate, which is the Latin Bible. And whenever he thought, as he was copying and translating for himself, this is not correct, he would stop writing, he would leave a gap in the text, a blank, and he would write the uh, Latin text in the margin. That's where you see the yellow. He would uh, then keep on copying until he found another one, blank spot in the text, Latin goes in the margin, and blah, 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 and so forth and so forth. Then, at some point, he thought, okay, I've done two or three choirs, I'm going to send that next door. That's uh, the guy in the other cell. So he calls the lay brother, he, he bends over, and as you maybe saw in that picture, when you uh, give your food in the monastery in the uh, Pathusian house, it goes in on this level, belly level, not because it's close to the belly, but because you can't see the person in the eye, so that's how much you are to avoid contact. So he shouts through the hole and says, I got more choirs. So this person laying on the grass requires gives next door, and that's the, the, uh, the orange, that's the translator. He will say, okay, let me see. In these three choirs, this is mistake, this is mistake, okay, he notes the Latin in the margin, let me translate it, that's what he does, and he puts it underneath it. Then he, done, you know, when he's done the three or four choirs, he shouts again, choirs up, choirs go back to the original, and the person writes the, the newly translated text in the gaps that he left as he was copying out the Middle Dutch in the main text. So it's a, you know, this is how they sort of were able to collaborate. It's something that I referred to in the beginning, even though they're not allowed to talk to each other. These two people never talk to each other, except for the half hour on Sunday, the Bible Augusta, you know, boring things. But not about this book, and still they were able to do so. Sometimes there are hiccups in the system. In one case, well, in multiple cases, but one scenario is that something that is noted as being flawed is not flawed. And then the person will say, this bell. So the translator will say, this is all right. So dear scribe who thought this was wrong, no, actually it's right, I'm not gonna touch it. It's to, it's to explain that I did not skip this, I see that you had Latin margin, but there's a reason why I didn't put a translation underneath it. So instead he writes, this well, this is okay. See, it's, it's communication. It's anticipating that, that there might be a problem, but you can't talk to this person next door. So this is what you do. This translator, um, I argue in my uh, thesis that the person that you see writing here is actually the same as that Bible translator, because his language is the same. He has to use the same uh, translation words, and there's other very complicated reasons, but um, trust me, it, it is uh, very likely this, this, um, this the same person. He's very stubborn, as he is in his prologues. And so he will say, when there is a place where there is something wrong in the main text, but it's not put in Latin in the margin, he will say, oh, wait a second, he didn't select this for retranslating, but I think it's not right. So he will put then the Latin in the margin, and then the Lisa writes the Dutch, and then he says, this is how I would translate it. Right? So this is a person who is in dialogue with the original translator of the Gospels, or the, the Epistles. Um, from the New Testament, and he says, well, I can do this much better. So this is, again, an example of how much they were into um, flawless text. Um, a very nice example, and this is very unusual that you have this, uh, I don't know, very many of this, of, of this kind. At one point, the same scribe is copying um, the other part of the New Testament, so the Gospels, and it's just filled with flaws. And it's one of those very old translations from the late 13th century, with lots of transliterations, so it will still have sabbata for, for instead of uh, Saturday, or it will still have um, words that you can actually, it's more Latin than Middle Dutch. And so you can imagine that this person, who was so busy in prologue saying, you know, this is right and this is wrong, and here as well, kept very frustrated with this particular book. And so he 
keeps on correcting as much as he can up to folio 93 verso, and then he writes this. He says, these Gospels have been translated poorly. Who did it had no idea what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I find, this is the sum of uh, these people trying to do their best and also being extremely frustrated with these very flawed texts that they get on their desks. So this was all to, to show you a little bit of the awareness of text, how it translates in practice into something you do in books. We are aware that something is not right, and you can actually read it on the page that they, not just that it was not right, it was flawed, but that they knew that it was flawed. So you can see their reflections on these texts, which makes it very interesting. Another thing that you see in these books from this particular Charterhouse firm is that they're able to collaborate in an environment that actually is not, a, it's not made, it's not perfect for collaboration. And, and I've already shown you that, so I can, I can see that. The last thing is another little trick that they had up their sleeves that is for a third uh, sort of uh, feature that is that they were able to correct the text in a very efficient way. And to do so, they invented various things. And one of them is you see um, in yellow here, you see two things. The first thing closest to the text column is in the margin first a B and underneath it an A. This is a very rudimentary and easy way of saying these two lines in this first text needs to be read to be read in reverse. So first you read the A line, and then you read the B line. Well, the fact that it has no influence on the meaning, but they knew this is the cadence is not right, so we need to put B and E in, uh, A and B in the margin. Uh, but the thing before before that is a little D that's struck out, and that's something that you find in many of these books from Hearn. And what it is, it's a symbol, not a correction symbol, you might say, but it's not really correcting something. It's an alert. It's saying there is something flawed here. And it's a, a derivative of this very older insular system uh, that you see here in a very old manuscript, in the 10th century manuscript, or well, even earlier, it would be 1988, um, where you have in the margin an H, lower margin with text next to it, and in between the two lines, interlinear, you have a D, so the same D with the struck out uh, bar, if you want. It's the F in, uh, in Anglo-Saxon script. It's, the, it's to say, here is something missing. Something is omitted, and you find the omission in the lower margin. E is the orsu, so down. Sometimes you have an S going up, susum. And the H is then geek here. So it essentially says, and the reader, of course, knows this, so the reader reads and sees a D and knows, oh, D down, so I'm going down to the lower margin. And here is that what needs to be read and then he goes up again to start continue after. So it allows the reader to have the whole text without the scribe having to erase essentially a whole lot of text to the uh, end of the, uh, of the page. You see that? So what you have in Hearn is that particular system as a derivative. So they didn't understand what it meant. The HD was lost on them as such. But they knew it was handy to have a system that was actually spotting mistakes. And you can see it here because this is an instance where uh, the scribe in the second round, so they, this is the same thing that I showed you before, going back and forth between the cells, but then the scribe also did a second round, so he wanted to correct the corrections that they made. Um, that's how far gone they were, in a sense. And, and then he used the D. He says, could this also be something that we need to correct or not? So alert. And then he sends it back to the person next door. So it's actually not a correction, but it's to query. Could we perhaps also do something about this, or is it not necessary? And that's another um, um, a reason for them to sort of work together but not talk to each other. So, oops, sorry. In conclusion, Carthusian houses are buzzing with life, with lively places where scribes are uh, copying books and they're very busy doing this and they're trying to do their best and they have means to make sure that the texts are as flawless as possible. So, a high production and a high production of books of very good quality. They are very careful in handling the materials, they have explicit rules how to handle materials, how to care for the books, um, and both of these things, high production and the flawless text, and the handling of the books are not treated that explicitly in uh, other orders. They've also developed a number of instruments to reach these goals. So they have developed things in the margins, language stating explicitly, meta-language, talking about your work um, that helps them to do this, and also little symbols, little Ds with struck out uh, little bars 
um, that helped him to communicate to somebody who they could not talk to that this is what I want you to do. Is this something perhaps we need to do, etc. Um, they also are standing out because in a time when monks are not producing books at high and high volume anymore in the 14th, 15th century, they are still doing this. They cannot go out to shop for books, they cannot go to commercial scribes, and they cannot meet that wonderful world of the commercially made manuscripts, and that is the world that you will get to know much better next week, Wednesday. sometimes might have these texts, might even have them um, uh, translated. So we have, for example, the uh, Court of Sicily, Frederick II, has lots of Arabic and Hebrew texts of magic, for example, and, and you, but you won't find that in, in the monastic world. You won't find that in the commercial world either. So there's no market for it, I guess, or perhaps because the, the, the worldly government was pretty strict with uh, what, what you could and could not do. Yes? Yeah, a good question. No, uh, not that I'm aware of, but it, it is almost always 14, 14 houses. Maybe, uh, let me see, if you build it, how can you do this? Can you make a square out of 14? That might, might just have a, it's not even a, yeah, no, as you see, I have no answer. No. <laughs> go, go ahead. What did they do with their time once they stopped copying books? Yeah, they, uh, they prayed a lot. And uh, they contemplated the loss. They have a process which they call uh, contemplation, uh, sort of a, they call it reading with a pen. So they used um, book production also for their own spiritual well being. So it's not just that, you know, it's three hours are gone, you know, okay, I can stop copying. No, it's, it's all, uh, also it gave them a chance to, for example, learn what Augustine meant much better. When the, and it still works. Huh? When I, when I uh, learned in high school, uh, German, for example, and I distinctly remember sitting down for the first time with my German textbook on the first day that I went to high school, and I just read it, and I thought, is this how you learn a language? And of course you don't, because I, it re didn't retain anything of what I just read. But then I realized, well, let's try to write it down, and so you write it down, and you write it down again. And when you do it three or four times with your mind, then it sticks. And, and that's actually what, what they do in, in the Cathedral House as well, but then not with German. But when they stop copying books? Praying, lots of praying. Will they stop completely copying books? And it was no longer necessary. Oh, that's what you mean. Um, How do they adapt? They will always copy books. They always will, even in the late Middle Ages. Yeah. Um, even now, I imagine um, they, they are still uh, copying books, but they may have moved on. They may have moved on to other uh, physical labor. So, bro broidery is in the female house. You sometimes see that broidery. Um, um, working in a garden sometimes, so the, uh, the Cathusians had their own little garden next to their little houses, little apartments, with miniature post stamp size gardens. Yeah. There's a question in the back. This, uh, I'll start in the very back and move forward. Yeah. Yeah, so did they just copy the books to learn themselves and to work the rest of the months? So the rest of the like, month is there as well? Very good question. Um, if you read Dutch, you can read my thesis. 
um, which argues that they actually produced this particular house uh, near Brussels, uh, books for people in the city. And we have uh, lots of evidence for this. So this makes total sense. And it's something that you also want to say because, of course, that's what the order's uh, rules say. We, we create a message for the world. Well, it's not a message unless you send it out. So the, it's already in the order's uh, rules, the manual, that we make something for other people. And that's actually, you see the book, the books uh, of Bern, locally produced manuscripts, particularly those with those local translations of the Bible translation of the city, uh, were sent out to patricians in Brussels. Um, in fact, we also know that these patricians came knocking on the gate asking for copies. And we also have reference to letters from the uh, Bible translator who, who quotes one of his letters in the prologue saying, um, I know that you also wanted this particular text, but I'm still working on the other one. Right? So there is a, there's a connection with people who wanted these Middle Dutch translations, particularly those, because that's not what you can buy in the bookstore in Brussels. We have, we have in Brussels commercial world from the 1320s. So by the time um, people start to get interested in vernacular books, and you may want to go to a commercial bookstore, you don't find your vernacular Bible there or your Psalter. So you need to find it elsewhere. And so they went to these houses to ask for translations and then also the copies um, that they could take home. Gentlemen, yeah, go With all the copying they were doing, that required a lot of skin. So where were they getting these animal skins? Yeah, good, good question. They, they probably, uh, well, they, they will have had to purchase it in the city or have purchased for them. So there also must have been sort of a system where uh, food and stuff was carted into the monastery, which makes you really admire people who, who lived in that valley that I showed you in Grenoble, because that would have been a long journey for these people to bring all that stuff. But, but sheets and ink and uh, th the wooden boards, stuff you, you want for your books, that, that's all being brought in from, from the outside world. Was it donated or were they selling their copies to raise money to purchase materials? Yes, the, very good question. Again, it's both. So we have evidence from her and also other houses that lots of these objects were donated, including glass stained windows, stained glass windows, for example, from the dining room were donated by this and that person. But also um, um, uh, normal things like wine. Um, so you, you have, for example, in a book in which the dead are commemorated, particularly those that were beneficial beneficiaries for the for the house, will say, and this person gave us on an annual basis so much wine. So then there is, you know, the little uh, cheering at the gate because. <laughs> the, the, the animal uh, wine comes in, yes. Other questions? I'm all the way in the back. Okay, um, well, do they just copy Christian texts? Do they have any classical texts as well? No classical texts, very unusual. So um, a monastery will often have your Cicero and your um, you know, text for grammar, for dialectics. That's not what you find in Carthusian houses, oddly enough. Short answer, but it's it. More? Yes. Oh, sorry. Just, no, no, go to you. Sorry, could you just go back to the that first palimpsest that you put up early on with the X-rays, yep. all much older text, older than the sixth century? Okay. This is quick. This one? Yes. It just gaze at that while you answer more questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this from the web this afternoon. So, so you can you can rip it yourself. If you Google on St. Catherine's and then spectral, you get this. And, and do you know what the, uh, the order of text is? No, I don't. I tried to find out, but I don't read Greek, so I couldn't. And then I thought, well, it's so flashy this picture, they won't ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? Yes, they did. Yeah. Because the bindings often uh, look the same. Uh, that said, we also have examples where they outsource to other monasteries. So there's a monastery very close to Bern, and they have little stamps. So it's, it's almost like uh, you know, when you see this, you, can, you know it's from us. So come here, we buy for you. So we have uh, books with the names of another monastery in the library of the Charter House. So they didn't bind everything, which also makes sense because we have 14 people churning out books. You, you may not just be able to keep up, or you may not have, at a certain point in time, a person capable of binding, and then you need to outsource it to elsewhere. So if you have 14 monks, how many support staff do they have? As well? They have a double, about 30. Yeah, and these, these people did everything. They uh, cooked, they carved the books around, they looked after uh, the, the, the health of these individuals. 
Yeah, and, and these, well, we call these lady brothers, and uh, they couldn't read or write, but they entered the, the house to, that was their way to, to uh, make sure that their spiritual welfare was at the right level, so to speak. Yeah. There was a question on that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering about the, okay, so they have these, um, you know, the A and the Bs and the F, right, the babies. How did they all know that that's what they were going to yeah. use as symbols? Yeah, yeah, like, that's good. Talk about yeah, so the, you would expect, this is normally what happens in Wall Street. You come in, and there is a little class, a school, where you are trained to write. And with writing comes writing in a certain way, or perhaps in two or three different ways, or different fonts, different scripts. But also all the correction methods, um, how to uh, decide the, how wide the page is. So all the books are, have the same dimensions, ratio, 1 by 0.7, as we still have it. So all that was, was trained to you. Now, that presumably also went on in Carthusian houses. Although that said, they didn't come often that young. So in the Benedictine houses, you would be six, seven years old and you would know nothing. You would just come in and people would train you from scratch from, from the ground up. But we see that in Carthusian houses, they're often a little bit older. And it makes sense because you can't put a six, seven year old in a cell, you know, and lock the door. Because I don't think on Sunday anybody would come running out because the door would be on the floor. So, so um, I have a seven-year-old, so I, I don't think it would work very well. It would be all over the place. So the, they were a little bit older, and so they already had the basics. Um, what they did, though, and this might be one of the reasons um, why the rules of the order were so precise, they needed to be blended, to molded into that one type of Carthusian monk. Namely, if they come from all over the place, different orders, and they enter a house, you want them to produce books that look the same, and so you need to be very careful in explaining how you correct, and what symbols to use, etc. So it makes sense in that sense as well, that the rules of Wigo are so detailed, as opposed to other order. And that's important too. Yes, all the way back. Yeah, I was just wondering, are, are, these, are these monks like, have a lot of uh, uh, control from, uh, from Rome and the Vatican, and yeah. they're, they're translating into various vernaculars, would that be not in the interest of Latin, yeah. uh, of Rome? There's a lot of control. There's also a lot of things they're not allowed to do. And you can see this really well with the Carthusians when there is a split in the church, the schism, which happens in the 14th century, when there are two popes, so the, the elected pope in Rome, the half of the, the cardinals don't like that choice, the French cardinals, and they elect their own pope, which will then go to Avignon, and you have two popes. The rule after that is, um, the Carthusians, of course, had a problem because they, the Pope is the replacement of Christ on earth. So now we have two. That's confusing for everybody, but also for Carthusians. And so the, the, the head, the, the mother house said, all the, all the monastic houses of Carthusians will follow the Pope, who is sort of chosen as the true Pope in the region where they live. This was a big problem for this particular charter house in 1393. I'm using this example to show you how um, Rome and sort of higher up has influence to, to downstairs, trickling down. Um, in Hern, they did not want to go to the other pope because it meant going away from Rome to Avignon. And they said, we will, will not do this. And so then the, uh, the head of the order sent um, a very infamous um, sheriff to the house to drag everybody out who did not follow the new pope, who did not want to switch from Rome to Avignon, and brought him in a boat to Antwerp where they were put under um, supervision of a very, very strict abbot, um, presumably so that they could uh, be sort of uh, brainwashed and so they could go over to the other side. So there is, it looks like isolation, not just the monastery far out, far out in the world from, from everything else, but also in the monastery, people in different houses, different cells, like a prison, but also it, it is at the same time, uh, things are directed from the top down. This was just one example. Other questions? They're pretty exciting, these guys, huh? <laughs> it's, not, it's not your average one, please. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the original source for the copied manuscripts. Mm -hmm. How is that? How is that stuff? Yeah, so it's part uh, of it's in the library. So they have a stock that you copy. And part of it is also coming in from outside, in the outside world. So the, the, the borrowing lending system. And then I think the latter is really something uh, that will be, the majority of input will be from the outside world. And they were also very keen on getting the latest, greatest texts. And um, they presumably also have shopped, perhaps, for um, 
new texts available in the surrounding monasteries, um, um, and cities perhaps even, and bring that back to their house and copy and disseminate further. They're, they're really copy machines, like an art copy machine. That's what you, you put something on and it comes out and it goes away and puts a new one, goes out. It's like a factory work. So they wouldn't write original things? There's some original, but not very many. Not very many. Yeah, I know exactly uh, how much. <laughs> it's a, in a nice script, it takes about four to six pages per day. You can do about four to six pages per day. So if you have a Bible, the rule of thumb is, which is what I usually tell my students, it takes a year. So a year to produce a Bible, which tells you also immediately why it's so expensive and why there are so few texts, period, in the medieval uh, period. If it's, a, if it's a very nice script, very high level script, the highest of the highest, then you can maybe do two to four pages. So that, you know, you sit down in the morning, and you have lunch, and you've done one page. That's quite amazing. When you think about it. People, people also in Middle Ages, uh, the scribes complain that it's a lot. It's very hard to do, and they say it hurts my fingers. And one of the expressions is, which I quoted uh, a few times uh, this week um, here at the university, the two fingers right, but the whole body aches, because it's your whole muscles, etc. You can't, for example, just to give you an example, you, you can't put your palm of your hand on the parchment leaf like you want to, because by the time you arrive at that spot, the grease from your hand will make the ink sort of flip off, it falls off. So you have to hover. So you hover like this. So this is en enormously uh, strenuous on, the, on your wrist. Yeah, of course. Um, some of the manuscripts you show were illustrated and some were not. Yeah. Um, what was their approach to illustration? Because presumably this, all monks weren't illustrated. Yeah, there's, there's no rules. It depends on um, um, if there is a capable illustrator present. The, the Cistercians, the other uh, order that went uh, you know, for poverty big time, they explicitly said, we will not illustrate our works. So we have maybe some decorated initials, but it can only be in this, this, and this color, three colors. So the reddish, bluish, and green. That's why you can recognize Cistercian manuscripts so easily. But the Cathusians didn't have that rule. But what we do have is, whenever you see uh, illustration in Cathusian manuscript, it's often very scruffy, simple, um, amateuristic. But that's a little bit of a subjective thing to say. But it's often because, of course, the scribe himself does this. Because if you, don't, if, if you can avoid collaboration, that's what you want to do, because it's difficult. So the scribe will often draw the stuff himself, and that's why it looks a little bit, you know, he may be a very good scribe, but a poor drawer. It is a very distinctive feature of uh, decoration in Cartesian houses, that. Yes? So, I mean, like if you were copying texts, but you're also translating them. So I'm wondering, because that, that takes a fair amount yeah, of analysis exactly. of, of yeah. the meaning of the text. Um, how much authority do those texts have on what we might read today of the same? You mean how? Smart of these texts, how yeah, yeah, I mean, they're totally free, but start translating yeah. can bring in a whole Well, as I said before, there's very few original texts coming out of the order. So if you translate something in the vernacular, real Dutch or French or English, it will often have uh, a Latin source. So in the best case scenario is it will be of the same authority as the Latin content lines, because it, it presents the Latin original in a very good manner in the vernacular. But in the Middle Ages, of course, vernacular is not seen as an authoritative text. Uh, sorry, vernacular, did I say vernacular? Vernacular is not seen as a language that you use for uh, authoritative uh, uh, text or, or uh, actions. And to the extent, and you can see this really in my own field, when there are scribes that produce Latin books and vernacular books, and I can see that they're the same hand, you can, you can also see that the Latin is written like this, Deep breath, beautiful. And the, and the vernacular is like, like that. So the same hand has different registers, as I call it, script registers, and it will go for the highest one for Latin and for the lowest one for vernacular, because that's not really something that you read text in the vernacular, because we all know Latin, but okay, there is this one person who can't read it, we'll, we'll make him a copy. So the authority is, if there is authority needed, they will always go for Latin, and will not do it in, in the vernacular. It takes a long time for the vernacular to get that same status. 
in fact, it, beyond the end of the Middle Ages. Yes? I'm sure that they have standardized their scripts quite an extent. And I just wonder if, if any models have been preserved that might have been used to teach the incoming monk yeah. this is the way we do it in our order. Yeah. Well, you can basically, because the script was so formalized within the order, you can use any text in a sentence. You can pick any book from the shelf and it will be more or less uh, sort of conform to what we do in the Cthulhuan house. But it's interesting that you raise this point. There are models for um, capitals, for initials, for larger letters um, in the Middle Ages. I don't know any examples from the Cthulhuan house, but since there are also so, so, much simil so many similarities between uh, the various names, that might just be the case there as well. So we have very nice model books in which you can even pick your decoration. And this is why some manuscripts have look very different in script, for example, the commercial. But, the, but the, the flourishing in the margins, this, the, the beasts that you see, the little birds, they are exactly the same in these two. How is that possible? Because it goes through a model book. Yeah. Maybe we should uh, call it a day? Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming. And, uh,